All right, welcome back forensic students. Um, today we are getting started in our fingerprint unit. So this is lesson one in fingerprints, uh, which is always an interesting topic in forensics and one that you probably have some background knowledge on. Uh, now, before we jump into the lesson, I wanna share this with you and see what you think or see how you would um, answer this question. So suppose one of these identical twins commits a crime and there's three pieces of evidence that are found at the crime scene, DNA, fingerprints, and an eyewitness account. Which of those three pieces of evidence would actually be useful to investigators? Now, did you say eyewitness account? If you did, um, think about the fact that because they look alike, that might not be helpful if you were trying to figure out which of these guys committed the crime. If you said DNA, same thing. Remember, identical twins have the same DNA. So that is normally a wonderful piece of evidence to have in a criminal investigation, but in this case, it's not going to help us identify which of the twins committed the crime. If you said fingerprints, you were right because even identical twins have different fingerprint patterns. And so fingerprints in this particular case would be more useful than, say, DNA or eyewitness accounts. Now, fingerprints offer what we call an infallible means of personal identification. Uh, do our mistakes made with regards to finger fingerprints? Absolutely. And we're going to look at a case study of, of that and some examples of, of cases where fingerprints um, led investigators down the wrong path. Uh, but there are lots of cases throughout history where fingerprints were very helpful in solving the crime. And that's because the current theory holds that no two people have the same fingerprint pattern. Uh, the ridges and the minutia patterns for each individual are unique. Now, there is a lot of debate surrounding this theory. There are a lot of people that say that this is not actually true, that people can share so many similarities that that uh, investigators believe some and believe that there are people out there that have the same fingerprint. But remember, um, a theory holds true until it's disproven, and so far it has not been disproven. So this theory makes fingerprints a super important ally to the forensics community. Now we're gonna go back in time. The origin of the fingerprint is actually unknown. Uh, but archaeologists have discovered fingerprints pressed into clay tablets. This is how they signed contracts dating all the way back to 1792 BC. So fingerprints have been around for quite some time. And the world of fingerprinting evolves from this date, 1792 BC. And today we use fingerprinting to match evidence to suspects. So I want you to take a second to look at the surface of your own fingertips. Um, and I want you to notice some things. First of all, hopefully you notice some ridges. And those are like the patterns, the raised parts that you see. Some people, um, like if you work with your hands for a living, you might notice that your ridges are less pronounced than somebody who, who um, does not work with their hands for a living. See if you notice any scars or um, deformities in your ridges. Some people, if you've been cut and you have a scar, you may see some um, deformities, something that makes your fingerprint a little more unique. I also want you to compare your right hand to your left hand. So are all of your patterns the same? Do they differ from fingertip to fingertip? What about left hand compared to right hand? Um, some people have mirror imaged fingerprints. So when they hold their left pinky and compare that to their right pinky, they might notice like mirror images, the same pattern, but mirror images. So everybody, you can see your fingerprints are, are unique to you um, and they are different from the person that might be sitting around you. So when we press the ridges of our fingertips against something, they leave a mark or an impression, and we call this a fingerprint. And remember, this uh, kind of ties into something we discussed in a 
previous lesson, Locard's exchange principle says every contact leaves a trace. And so fingerprints are a wonderful example of that concept. Now the imprint of a fingerprint consists of natural secretions from the sweat glands that are present in the friction ridges of our skin. And you can see this is a pretty complicated diagram, but you can see how those secretions move up through the pores of our skin. And then we mix that with dirt and oils and other things that we might touch or pick up on our, um, our ridges or our fingertips. Then when we touch objects, these secretions leave behind traces. Now, sometimes those traces are invisible to the naked eye. So if you take your fingertips and you just press them on your desk or um, a hard surface that's around you, you might not see a pattern left behind. Um, and we're going to talk about what that has a name. Um, and we'll talk about that in the next lesson. Now, if you have some dirt or something on your hand, maybe some colored oils, or ladies, if you wear makeup and you touch your face and then touch your desk, you might actually see your fingerprints. Um, so you can have what we call invisible fingerprints and you can have um, visible fingerprints and we call those latent and patent prints. Again, we'll get to that in a future lesson. Now, fingerprints are named for their patterns and there's three classifications of fingerprints. So we have loops, we have whirls, and we have arches. Now within those classifications, you can get pretty complicated and those can be further classified. But I do want you to know sort of the breakdown. Arches are least common. In fact, 5% of the world population has arch fingerprints. So if you're looking at your fingertips and you notice some arch patterns, then you are in the minority. Whirls make up about 30% of the population, and then loops make up about 65% of the population. So loops are our most common fingerprint pattern, then whirls, and our least common fingerprint pattern uh, happens to be arches. Now we're going to talk about minutia patterns in a, in a a future lesson, but I just want to kind of throw this out. There are different patterns that appear on fingerprints. Um, and we're not talking about loops, whirls, or arches. We're talking about specific patterns. We call these minutia patterns. So two specific minutia patterns that I wanted to bring up to you today is something called a core and then a delta. So the core is the center of a loop fingerprint or a whirl. And a delta is like a triangular region near a loop. So this is where fingerprint patterns sort of merge together. Now, you can also have something called a ridge count, which is a quantitative measure um, that investigators can look at or fingerprint analysts can look at by counting from the core of the um, fingerprint to the edge of the delta. And this gives them a number. It's the number of ridges that pass from the core to the delta. And it's just a, a better way to distinguish quantitatively one fingerprint from another. Now I want you to look at this because I mentioned this earlier, you can have different types of whirls. So here we see three different breakdowns of whirls and you can see how the deltas are in different locations for these different fingerprints. So the central pocket loop uh, whirl, and then you have the double loop whirl, and then accidental whirl, so you can further break down your fingerprint patterns. You have different types of arches, and so you can see the difference between the plain arch and the tinted arch. You also can have different types of loops. So I'm going to show you a neat website real quick. So if you go to um, touchandgoid.com, and then you find their eight most common fingerprint patterns. They actually have a breakdown of the different types of arches, loops, and whirls, and then a picture and a little description associated with each of those fingerprints, um, and then some more information. So after the video, I want you to um, hop over to this website. Again, it's touchandgoid.com. Uh, and then you want to find the eight common fingerprint patterns and just kind of look over these fingerprint patterns and become familiar because in future lessons and in some review activities that we're going to do, you're going to have to be able to distinguish these and name them. Um, so go ahead and head over to that website now, do a little bit of research, and I'll see you in the next lesson.